Okay, well, thanks for a lovely talk, but one of the issues you didn't address and didn't address in your review of books paper with Eric is of course who funds the campaigns that allow political parties to get elected. Because we are in danger of ending up with plutocracies despite all the institutional structure that we have by allowing the very, very rich to fund the campaigns of the people they want in power. Well, yes, yeah. I think the funding question is big, but uh, I don't think that's really what prevented. If you take, take the American one, I think, uh, in fact, um, I believe, along with my colleague Eric Maskin, with whom we have been writing it for a different voting system, uh, the Americans were hampered by a bad electoral procedure also, uh, denying majority vote, going by plurality, uh, not taking into account that Trump lost the first 18, 17 of the, of the primaries and so on. Uh, I think there was funding was available. It wasn't the case there very much, I think. Yeah, actually, I mean, uh, Clinton had more money than Trump had. I think in the case of uh, Britain, I think, I would say the media played a bigger part there than funding as such, uh, including uh, I was amused if concerned to read when the High Court decided that Parliament had to be consulted. It was one of the papers thought that the British have been slighted. And, uh, so I think you are absolutely right, David. There is an institutional issue, not just the issue of commitment. And how to do it remains, and I haven't given an answer to that. But uh, in order to motivate that, we have to say why is it that we need it. And also, there have been, in, case, in, in case of Britain, I think the biggest problem has been a premature closure. If you have a vote, particularly with a very narrow margin, but even otherwise, uh, where there have been a, the quality of, epistemic quality of the debates preceding it and the facts placed on the uh, on ground have been questionable. I think the, I think uh, if I may <laughs> guess, I think it would upset John Stuart Mill very much as no government-wide discussion. Government-wide discussion isn't a kind of periodic vote and then everything goes to sleep. It's a continuous discussion. This didn't happen at all. In case of India, I think the media plays a part. The ability of the government to influence media by advertising, uh, government revenue is a very big part. India is one of the countries remaining where the newspapers are expanding in circulation. Uh, and it makes money, but it's just but that is very dependent on, on, on government revenue, and the government spent a lot advertising, not only the picture of the prime minister and such things, but also other things. So there is that issue. It's, it's more that rather than the ownership itself, which is business community, but there's sufficient diversity among them to allow, I would say, at least two or three dissenting opinion on most subjects that you can get. But I, I think the kind of readership is a problem, the, uh, the, not so much for the monetization issue, but even for that, the, the fact that it's so upper middle class oriented uh, itself is, a, is, an, is an issue. Uh, so I think all the, in France, now here's a thought which I go into paper and I, in my book, but I don't go in here, that I think they need to have a different political uh, electoral system. Uh, and I, here I'm afraid I'm being um, advocating mask in Sen, as it were, <laughs> as it's known in the New York Times and the New York Review of Books, uh, which, is, uh, which is to follow Marquis de Condorcet and do majority vote. I mean, take this example, and this is just an institutional reform. That um, if the three, if you think of three candidates, uh, Marine Le Pen and a socialist, uh, uh, let's call him Valls, I don't know whether it's Valls, I'll call him socialist, 
uh, a conservative, uh, Fillon or somebody like that, I think. I think Joe Stiglitz and I were reprimanded by him by appearing 10 minutes late in a public meeting and so on. Uh, so I, 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 it can be said I know him. Uh, 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 the, so uh, a conservative, now suppose 40% put Le Pen on top and then either order, socialist con conservative. 30% uh, put uh, uh, socialist on top and then the conservative and then Le Pen. And another 30% put conservative on top, then the socialist and then Le Pen. Now, in terms of plurality, uh, Le Pen would carry the day. And that's what makes him think, okay, drop out one of them. And that's what happened when Chirac got re-elected with fighting against Le Pen, uh, the present Le Pen dad. But uh, why should it have to be? If you had a followed conversation, you rank all three, and then you can make all fairwise comparisons. So you can easily put uh, uh, Val, Trillon, uh, 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 Le Pen, or Philo, uh, Val, Le Pen, and neither takes away votes for the others. You compare fairwise. And each of them, in this case, would have defeated Le Pen. And we would have had an opportunity of seeing whom would the people, people would have preferred. I think that requires an institutional reform, uh, and uh, uh, if not in the masking send line, some other line, it certainly needs that. Britain had something of that because of the first past the post system, and India, uh, Mr. Modi got 31% of the vote, but uh, majority of the seats, uh, BJP got 31% of the vote, it's the Hindutva party though a majority of Hindus voted against the BJP, uh, not to mention the majority of Indians. But, the, um, but because of the plurality system, uh, you with 31% votes, you can still capture the majority of seats. That's one of the last uh, remaining uh, British tradition that survived in India, <laughs> and we might want freedom from that. Uh, <laughs> So, um, so I think they require change. So I'm, really, I'm really delighted you asked the question because the next step is, therefore, what do we do? Okay, these are the funds, what do we do? And perhaps I might catch and chat with you on that. Thank you. First of all, you, sir. Thank you. I think there's a lot of sympathy with that point. The, um, <laughs> the, 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 the practical question is one of audibility, and you were audible. Uh, deepest apologies, but I think that's where we, we are, unless we develop a relay system or something of the kind. Um, uh, sir. Thank you. Uh, Professor Sen, um, we last corresponded when I was a head of mathematics at the only British European school, and you were Master of Trinity. And we should have met because I interested you by telling you that I'd learned to teach mathematics through discussion. My pupils from the age of 10 learned their mathematics by arguing with each other. This, I must say, attracted your interest. My headmistress refused to let me go on punishment of being sacked, and I was too much of a coward. But I wonder, would that have your support today? Before you ask, I think the answer will be yes to that question. But I'd like to tell you that at first there was enormous interest in the European Union. The European Education Commission invited me to lecture in Europe. And at first there was great enthusiasm. And then the enthusiasm began to wane. 
And this, I think, directs, should direct our, our attention to the reason for Brexit. Brexit happened because the British people began to realize Europe was not actually interested in democracy. And this was a sign of it to me. Interest in my teaching mathematics through, math through discussion died. Thank you. Well, I am very interested in the point, and I remember the discussion that you were referring to in the past. Um, of course, mathematics could be taught in many different ways, and discussion uh, the, um, could be a good method of pedagogy there. I, uh, you know, and as I think we discussed then, we could see to what extent it could be done. There have to be something other than discussion as well, possibly, I think, my point would have been. But I think that from there you go to a much bigger, well, different issue, namely Europe lost interest in that, and you take that Europe is not interested in democracy. That, I don't think, actually follows. There are so many issues involved in democracy uh, and that the question of how to teach maths belongs to it, but uh, there, there's room for many other considerations. You're talking about a whole lot of people. You know, uh, I was, my late wife was Italian. Her father was killed. It was, it, she was in, he was in the resistance in Italy fighting for democracy, and he was killed um, by, by the fascists in Rome two days before Americans arrived in Rome. A lot of people have done a lot to fight for democracy. So to say Europe is not interested in democracy is, is a, slight, uh, a slight thing remark, I would say, to which I can't agree. Uh, now, public deliberation has led to a practical improvement in our arrangements. Um, so mics can't travel up and down the, the, the levels. But um, you, you were pretty audible. So what I, what I suggest is that we do take questions from, uh, have an opportunity for questions from higher up. I'm very keen that students get an opportunity to um, intervene in the discussion. And I wonder if, a, if, if, it, if they're really succinct, then someone who has a microphone could repeat it so we're sure that everyone uh, here has heard it. No. <laughs> my, the, my amplification proposal deals with that. Is there someone with a microphone? No, let's go higher up. Is there, okay, there we are. Yeah. He was sitting higher up, but he came down to us. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Um, thanks, Professor Sen, for a very succinct and timely lecture. In a world where um, state decisions disproportionately begin to affect more and more non-citizens, and also where non-citizens have more and more to offer to the state in terms of decision-making, should not the space of public deliberation and democratic scrutiny that you have talked about be expanded to non-citizens, and if so, on what basis of inclusion? To all citizens, meaning... Uh, uh Non-citizen. Non-citizen, yeah. So maybe a bit like the immigration point we discussed. Yeah. For example. Well, of course, to some extent, non-citizens actually do vote in, 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 in some elections. I voted in Brexit uh, because I retained my UK residence. Uh, and as a Commonwealth citizen subject to the Queen, even though I'm not a citizen of Britain, I'm allowed to vote, and I thank the Queen for it, because <laughs> it's because of my loyalty to her that I could vote. Uh, but I think your point, and by the way, this is not a negligible point, because in the days when Britain was doing a lot better than, than say, France and, uh, and the immediate, uh, uh, our neighborhood of uh, Germany hadn't come into the story very much with France and Belgium and so on. Uh, I think one of the reasons why 
that happened was because uh, there was a kind of intrusion of the immigrant. Uh, I mean, the, it applies particularly to countries like India, which does not allow dual citizenship. Uh, a Pakistani or Bangladeshi could be both British and Pakistani and Bangladeshi, an Indian cannot. Uh, and it's, I think, to some extent, uh, the, uh, is, the, uh, is this illusion of uh, grandness in, in India, which, which is on the way. But in any case, even if you become a Bangladeshi or Pakistani, you may become British without losing your system. It takes time. And uh, the system, the moment you are legally settled in a, in a country as a non-citizen, and if you come from this commonwealth, then you actually had a vote, and the vast majority uh, is changing now with European immigration of people coming in were actually from the commonwealth. So I think uh, you find it right, uh, and including non-citizens who are resident would be uh, would be a, a wise thing to do. Uh, I think um, uh, I did actually write something on that some years ago uh, when I uh, thought that Britain was very wise in this and not so wise in, in the multicultural, the way it took the multiculturalism, whereby there was no negotiation, you know, where you have to be a member of Britain as a member of a community or other. I remember on the day there was a tube bomb in the, on the was it 6th of July or something like that? Uh, when, what? Yeah, and I was, uh, I, I, I happened to be in, in Germany for a, 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 for a um, lecture and uh, a Bangladeshi friend of mine uh, called me and gave me the news what's happening. And then he said that we have also had an appeal from the government that we must speak on behalf of our community. So he said, look, I'm a Muslim. <laughs> I'm also a member of the Labour Party. I'm quite active in the council. And I have a, most of my friends uh, belong to a different religion. Uh, but this ad admonition that I must work through the community is a limiting feature. So I think when we come to, I think you're very right to raise this kind of question because whether citizens vote, uh, non-citizens vote, presumably if they're resident, can't be anyone in the world vote in a British election. But I think there are wise policies that Britain has followed from which there is much to learn uh, from Britain itself today and, and other countries. And also there are some unwise policies um, making a, a break between the person, the individual, and the society. Uh, my book begins with a uh, sentence of Marx, uh, which is a, a, a part of a brilliant discussion as to why the relation, you cannot think of society as an abstraction from the individuals. And the relationship between the individual and the society is really quite central. That, of course, is the idea of social choice also, which is why the book used that as a, as a quotation. So it raises all kinds of issues. And if you, we had more time, perhaps you could explain why uh, non-citizens having voting rights, precisely what kind of move you might wish to take. But I can see some fruitful thinking. Certainly, fruitful public discussion there could be really important. Good. I continue to favor um, questions from students, at, at least for now. So by any means consistent with health and safety regulations, um, could someone... Um... Oh, yes, good. Where are you? Okay, yeah. Do you have a microphone? We'll, we'll yeah. relay it, yeah. My question is about social media and what you think of it as a platform for this public discussion. Do you think that it helps or it will create echo chambers or at least on Brexit and the recent US election? The question is about social media yeah. no, I and its contribution. Yeah, I oh, perfect, perfect. heard that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the clue is not to use microphones. <laughs> um, 
You know, the social media um, certainly has expanded our communication uh, ability strong, uh, strongly. But um, so the, uh, social media is also open to manipulation. Uh, and I, I get persistently attacked, mostly by the Hindutva group. And, I, I, and whenever I give a speech on that, I know that there will be about minimally about 150, but possibly 3,000 attacks. And I feel quite neglected when I don't get uh, <laughs> at least 150 attacks. But they fall, I discover they fall into, usually into four or five types, A, B, C, and D. And you can see that people are using, repeating themselves, and they have somebody has, uh, saying, use form B and form C and form D and so on. Um, uh, some are more uh, uh, censorious than others. Um, so I think uh, one of the problems that there is with social media is what in India is often called trolling, that you could silence people by f uh, making them afraid of uh, opening their mouth, because the moment they open their mouth, uh, something would happen. I, and I know that there was one occasion when there was a policy debate going on about university policy, uh, when, to which I was supportive, and I expressed that view that I was supportive of that. I would get immediate call from three of the organizers of the movement saying, please do not write anything in support, because it would generate a huge amount of attack on our policy, and you should keep completely out of that. Now, that also, that must indicate that it, just as it opens up some voices, it also closes down some voices. I think the trolling is a very big issue in, in when they're organized uh, effort, and particularly of one group. This happened in America in a big way, too. And when there's a clear, as when there's symmetry on that, I mean, you could be, you give as much as you take, but uh, when, that's typically not the case. I think uh, uh, one side had a great deal more uh, than, the, I mean, Trump had a great deal more than Clinton, and I think if, uh, say, uh, Bernie, uh, Bernie Sanders had a reasonable amount, but if, say, somebody like Bloomberg came into the, uh, came into the picture with a very little uh, on, on that side. So I think you're asking a very big question. I think that social media is both a great asset as well as in danger. But what the, the, the uh, it is going back to uh, uh, the, the kind of question came up from David Henry uh, querying me, that uh, yes, it has those features. Therefore, what should we do? Can we prevent, how can we prevent people from being uh, you know, put in a corner and then my life being made impossible by, uh, by, um, uh, by systematic attack. And systematic attack is not just saying, uh, I mean, I, uh, um, I also get some of these letters. It's well known that Amartya Sen is explicit, expletive here, which I delete. The question is what kind of an Explicit, explicit, deleted, is he? <laughs> and so on. Uh, uh, but these are kind of, I would say, non-specific attacks. Uh, but then there's some more specific attacks who then uh, uh, would say something uh, about uh, basically distorting some, uh, some fact or, or other. And separately, though, from uh, the question of attacks and trolling, that what about the echo chamber aspect of the question, the idea that you get these extremely polarized groups and the sort of middle ground in which public discourse used to take place can just fall away. Yeah, but uh, you know, uh, echo chamber is, uh, is the many, I mean, if it is not trolling, if it's not organized attempt at that, if it is just come and join, um, I don't see that that necessarily such a bad thing, because if we take that view, then we would again be against the public possessions. Uh, 
you know, people follow you, they join you, yeah. Uh, uh, so I'm not sure that echo chamber would join me. There would be many echo chambers in different directions. Uh, I think um, it's the organized uh, uh, silencing of attempt to silence people, which is, uh, which has, in India has been used very asymmetrically uh, by one group of very organized uh, people. Uh, and, and and so has it been in America. I haven't heard that it has been so much in Britain, possibly not. Now we've sorted out our acoustic problems so well. Can yeah, I, um, actually, yes, can, we will. We're doing well. Yeah, we're doing um, well, yeah. Any more? Um, what about up, up here? Some questions from students. Uh, yes, with a type, yep. Well, I think, uh, uh, first of all, uh, let me make a minor point, it's a footnote. I think to see John Stuart Mill as only a libertarian may be a mistake. He also described himself as a socialist. He also had a lot of thoughts about inequality. Uh, he was um, very concerned in, with uh, um, gender inequality being neglected uh, and uh, was one of the pioneering voices in that, which is not only a libertarian cause and may not be a libertarian cause at all. But what would have John Stuart Mill brought there? I take it that in some way where you are asking the question uh, 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 to elicit an answer to that. I think what would be, I think his methodological point was that we need lot of public discussion on that to understand uh, what is going on. A lot of things are not clear until there is much more public discussion. Um, I think the, um, in the absence of public discussion, you could um, believe uh, that um, um, many things would be impossible, for example, I believe for a long time it would be impossible to have rules that not only uh, stopped people smoking uh, if others are annoyed, but uh, go further and just ban smoking from public places in which there's no one present, but on grounds that that might deter people from going there. If I was asked a question on that, I would have said that it's unlikely to go, but I think it did. But to a great extent, because public discussion changed it. I was surprised that even France and Italy, where people seem to continuously smoke, uh, did have that feature. So I think public discussion could change the character of our understanding. That would have been, I think, the main point I would take from John Stuart Mill. Um, I think on the particular issue, of, were you asking what back Mill's view of Brexit would have been. You are not, no? <laughs> no, okay, good. Yeah. And uh, it probably would have differed from whatever person you described as the scoundrel, I think. So. <laughs> I think you probably would have been, I mean, he was very keen on communication. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, he was pretty well read too, of course, phenomenally well read. And uh, so I think it's, it's a good question. I'll, you didn't ask it, but I will think about it as to what John Smith Miller would have done. <laughs> We've got time for um, one more. Yes, please. Uh, 
Professor Sen, you constantly mentioned about the importance of public discussion. Uh, my concern here is uh, with the, uh, I mean, with the way there has been a proliferation of information and uh, the manner in which truth continues to be fractured, and also because uh, you mentioned about the Brexit campaigners speaking about uh, money that goes to the EU, EU which could have been go, go, which could go to the NHS. I mean, we do realize that uh, our inf our subjectivities, our opinions are being constantly formulated by uh, mechanisms that present truth in a highly fractured manner. And what and there's a huge and gradually we are we are getting into a post-truth age. So in such circumstances, how possible is it to have a very informed public discussion or how critical would actually our discussions be uh, in case there exists some scope of a public discussion? Well, I think uh, uh, I, I understand your concern, but I, I think um, I would resist the idea that we are ever in a position when we cannot um, try to get the attention of others. Um, you know, I think there are things have, um, many things have happened. I mean, in India, for example, there hasn't been change in, in, in sensitivity adequately to the, to the caste and inequality issue, certainly. And yet there have been a lot of laws passed and reservation of seats and jobs and so on to, uh, to help the uh, the underdogs of society, um, and it, it's a partial success, but partial failure. We should go on protesting about partial failure, but I don't know that I would give up uh, the debate, and the same applies to Brexit. Sometimes people don't like engaging in, in, in debates because it looks unpleasant, but I think we are... Um, uh, we have a reason to be unpleasant, I think, when we are talking with each other. Uh, uh, the, um, sometimes you have to get out their opinion only through effort. And since I referred earlier to Italian resistance, and I might illustrate my point with one of the stories from the Italian resistance, it's a, I think I've used it in some book. Um, it's an Italian, it's a fascist recruiter. This is a story from 1924-25, who is going around recruiting people in the villages to the fascist party. And this chap goes and gets hold of someone, and he said, look, you ought to join the fascist party. We are doing all these things, trains are running on time, and the malaria has been removed from the swamps, and so forth. That's all Mussolini is doing why wouldn't you join the fascist party? And he said, no, I can't join the fascist party because my father was a socialist. I am a socialist. My father was a socialist. My grandfather was a socialist. How could I join the fascist party? And to which the fascist recruiter said that this is a terrible argument, absolutely terrible argument because that does not bind you in any way. And he said, no, no, it's a very big thing for me. Uh, so the recruiter said, well, what would you have done if your father had been a murderer and your grandfather had been a murderer? What would you have done then? And the chef said, well, then, of course, I would have joined the fascist party. <laughs> <laughs>